I, I'm going to start my talk by advertising uh, somebody else's paper that I hope everybody here will read. Maybe everybody already has. That would be great if I'm telling you what you already know. Um, the paper is called Could a Neuroscientist Understand a Microprocessor? And it's free and online by Eric Jonas and Conrad Cording. I don't know if either are in the room. Um, and what they tried to do was to reconstruct the way that a 6502 microprocessor worked. That's the one you'd find in Apple II or the computer I learned to program on, the Commodore 64. So they had a reconstruction of this. And then they let loose all of the techniques of modern neuroscience. I don't have time to go through all of the things they did, but they did lesion analysis and single unit recording and dimensionality reduction. And the question was, could you figure out how a 6502 works by using all these techniques? And the answer was no. They were more polite than, than me. But they said, current neural approaches reveal interesting structure in the data, but do not meaningfully describe the hierarchy of information processing in the microprocessor, which is, I think, a very polite way of saying it didn't work. Um, this suggests current analytic approaches in neuroscience may fall short of producing meaningful understanding of neural systems, regardless of the amount of data. And David had a, a nice quote about, we want in insights. We want meaning. We don't want, we just want a bunch of numbers. So part of what I want to talk about today is what I think is the original sin in uh, approaches to cognitive neuroscience and understanding the mind in general, um, which is a misguided quest for the one neural circuit that rules them all. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm talking about this idea of a canonical cortical circuit. If there was just one kind of cortical circuit, maybe we could do PCA or something like that, and magically all the answers would fall out. But we're missing, I think, an intermediate level that I'll talk about. Um, before I do, just to show you that I'm not talking about a straw man, there are quotes going back 40 years to people saying things like, well, the brain can be seen as a cooperative network that acts as a nonlinear spatiotemporal filter with adaptive properties. That's exactly what a deep learning system is, by the way, to connect to the last talk that transforms afferent signal flow and to assume that these filter properties are identical for all neocortical areas. So that's like saying, I think the brain is just one big deep neural network. Um, and there are reasons why people might want to do this. Like the concept of a canonical circuit gives you a powerful unifying principle. And they talk about hierarchies of processing, which is, again, deep learning. Wouldn't that all be swell? And there's lots of reasons why you might believe this idea, starting with a somewhat surprising fact. Actually, it's the astonishing fact that the cortex is, is relatively uniform between areas. So when I went to graduate school, we talked about Broca's area for language and you know, occipital cortex for vision. We imagine them to be wholly different things, but you look at the anatomy and at least to a first approximation, they're awfully similar. And that's surprising if you take a strong modularity view. I don't think it's devastating, but it is surprising. Uh, another reason why you might be looking for this one canonical circuit is that hierarchies of processing, which is what people are always talking about when they talk about canonical circuits, clearly play a role in neural computation. Nobody could get up here and say, well, I just don't think that there's hierarchical processing in the brain. That would be absurd. Surely it happens. We know that from Hubel and Wiesel. Somebody said it was the greatest single influence on the way neuroscientists think about the brain during the second half of the 20th century. It's still the greatest influence in, in this century. Um, and you know, the apotheosis of it is we have like Oprah Winfrey neurons that are like high in some hierarchy and respond cross-modally, um, you know, presumably by some hierarchy. So I believe that the brain does some hierarchical processing. Then there's a set of experiments um, from my alma mater that are wildly misinterpreted about the interchangeable uh, nature of cortex, so you can connect um, visual inputs to auditory cortex, and the auditory cortex sort of understands as if it understands those visual inputs. The important thing to remember is those experiments were only done in sensory areas in um, places where you're basically doing spectral analysis. Nobody ever showed that you could do this in prefrontal areas or something like that. I wrote to Morganka Sir and said, did you ever try? And he said, we tried not that hard. I gave a talk at Berkeley and said, what I think that means is that he put six postdocs on the problem and it never really worked. And someone raised her hand and said, I was one of those postdocs. Um, so I think it's overrated, but people do lay it out in this argument. Another Another reason for it is the apparent success of deep learning. Deep learning, as we just saw, works great. It crushes some of the old models uh, in certain kinds of visual tasks, like telling Tiger Woods from a golf ball. Um, you know, ImageNet is great with deep learning, and it's better than your SIFT features and so forth. And it turns out you can put it in the context of a symbolic model that does tree search um, and play a pretty mean game of Go. People um, sometimes misinterpret that as saying that deep learning by itself is sufficient for Go. That's not actually true if you look at how AlphaGo works. Um, but surely the success of deep learning lends some credence to the idea that hierarchical processing is great. And there would be parsimony. It would be wonderful if we could have 
all of neuroscience understood in four equations on a t-shirt, just like we're kind of hoping for in physics. I just don't think it's going to work that way. Parsimony, in fact, I think is, is a bit of a false god. But um, people are looking for it and, and like it. Um, but the problem, well, it begins here with what Dublin's doc, Dr. Bono Vogue said um, in his lament about canonical cortical circuits. He said, I still haven't found what I'm looking for after four decades. Um, so, you know, Bono's a little disappointed. Of course, the absence of evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence. Just because we haven't found the canonical circuit doesn't mean it's not there. But my guess is we're never going to find the one true canonical circuit to rule them all. That hierarchical pattern uh, perception is just one of many things going on. And the reason is that because if there's one thing that we actually know about biology, it's that biology is tremendously diverse everywhere we look, at every level that we look. So we can look at cortical areas going back to Brodmann. There are a lot of them. If we know nothing else about the brain, it's that you can stain it in different ways and all kinds of different things are happening in different places. Or you can look at cell types and they're like, you take one little area and there's like 40 different cell types. Um, or you can look at a single cell, you look at a single synapse and you find 400 different proteins and they're probably different from one synapse to the next. That is telling you that you want diversity, not one neuron that you put in your deep net that is all purpose, that does summation and, and integration and you're done. Um, so I love this quote at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it from Cajal, um, who of course neuroscientists love to cite. He says, unfortunately nature seems unaware of our intellectual need for convenience and unity and very often takes delight in complication and diversity. Well, why are we looking for one thing? I don't know. Meanwhile, despite all of deep learning's obvious power, it's not clear that one mechanism on its own can actually get AI to human level intelligence. So it's been great for speech recognition, but I think there's a lot of problems with it. I wrote a, a piece on Archive that's gotten a lot of traffic lately, um, a month or so ago, with 10 problems for deep learning. It's very data hungry, it's shallow, and has limited capacity to transfer and so forth. I won't go through all of them now, you, you can look it up. Um, one of the things you find every time you build a deep learning system is it works really well for some problems in a domain and then utterly falls on its face elsewhere. Um, so you have a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. That's a caption generated by a system at Google. It's very impressive. Wow, we've solved the language and vision problem problem, um, where we have a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road, but there's a long tail problem. The stuff we have a lot of data for, these systems work well. You move out of that regime and things fall apart. This makes me think of Oliver Sacks, man who mistook his wife for a hat. Well, here's a captioning system that mistakes a parking sign with stickers on it for a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drink. Um, not so impressive. Um, here is a picture of a turtle that is um, interpreted by an ImageNet trained system as a rifle. Um, you should be a little worried if you think about drones and autonomous weapons and see that. So what I always get from people like Jan LeCun is, yeah, but that's just an optical illusion and people are subject to optical illusions. Um, and so e. Goodfellow took that remark seriously. I've always said it's more like hallucinations than optical illusions. But Goodfellow did a study and he found that for some set of these uh, materials, which are called adversarial examples, there's a whole industry on them right now. For some set of materials, he got people to, based on some psychometric evidence, be kind of subject to the same illusions. Now, I think you have to kind of squint your eyes to get that interpretation, but you can squint your eyes, you can get that interpretation until you look at the time course of the study and what happens if you give people more time. So if you give people 60 milliseconds, they behave kind of like deep nets. If you give them a second, they don't fall for it at all. Well, what is that telling you? It's telling you that deep learning is good at what um, cognitive neuroscientists ought to call bottom-up perception, but not so good at top-down perception. There's another example where you put a sticker of a toaster next to a banana. The deep Deep learning system says that it's a toaster, any human being says it's a sticker of a toaster next to a banana. We have some higher level information, like we understand you can have a sticker and a banana and that they're not necessarily the same thing and that you want to ha describe multiple elements. Deep learning systems just can't do that. Of course, I saw this coming uh, a while ago, uh, much to the consternation of everyone who was enthusiastic about deep learning. I wrote a New Yorker piece about this um, a little over five years ago. I said, realistically, deep learning is only part of the larger challenge of building intelligent machines. Such techniques lack ways of representing causal relationships and are li likely to face challenges in acquiring abstract ideas. They have no obvious ways of performing logical inferences, and they're still a long way from integrating abstract knowledge. I stand by every word that I wrote. It was kind of pessimistic 
optimistic and you could say, hey, look at all the progress deep learning has made, but I don't think it's made progress on any of these things. A way of thinking about it from a cognitive neuroscience perspective is there's been some pro progress on perception, but none of the other things that we really think go into cognition. And even perception is not solved. Nobody ever believes me because I'm an outsider. I'm not a mach card carrying machine learning person, even though I built and sold a company that no did nothing but that. But anyway, um, they, they don't take my word for it. But here's Yashua Bengio, who's one of the three founders of deep learning. You can read his recent paper on the tendency of convolutional neural networks to learn surface statistical regularity. So he's got the data for what I've been saying all along. So here's a different perspective. Maybe instead of one true ring to rule them all, the cortex consists not of single repeated canonical computation, but a heterogeneous set of basic circuit types. And um, this is an article that I wrote in Science with Adam uh, Marblestone and Tom Dean uh, in 2014 called The Atoms of Neural Computation. And the inspiration for this was a kind of circuit which has actually become more popular since then called an FPGA. Well, an FPGA is sort of like a microprocessor in that it does computation. Um, it's sort of like a six-layered cortical sheet in that if you look at it under a magnifying glass, you see ho homogeneity. You see one kind of circuit. But you can customize it so each bit of that circuit does a different logical function. So effectively, you can have a, a set of primitives that you use in different places. You do the computation roughly in parallel. It looks like it's homogenous, but when you dig down into the deep details, there's actually lots of computations doing different things. In a supplement to that article in BioArchive, and you won't be able to see this, but you can look it up later, we tried to lay out a bunch of computations, and this was an homage to David Marr. We looked at the different levels of representation, essentially, and said, here are things like working memory and gain control and variable binding, and here are computations that you could perform, different kinds of circuits that you could put in your FPGA-like brain. And this also relates to a book that I wrote in 2001 called The Algebraic Mind. And the central claim of that was that to capture human cognition, we can't just use multi-layer perceptrons, which are the forerunners of modern deep learning. We have to have other things like primitives for symbol manipulation, including storage and retrieval of variables, operations over those variables, machinery for structuring representations, and so forth. So why should you believe this? Well, we don't know the answer yet. It's a conjecture. It's a piece of a big theory. It's a small, tiny theory morsel. Um, but here, here's some evidence that, that you might think about. First of all, um, recent studies have shown that developmentally there exist ways of configuring the microcircuitry of individual blocks in appropriately customized ways. So th there are combinatorial codes that can tell particular neurons where you should connect to, for example, which is the kind of thing that at least you would want if you were going to build in silico um, your own FPGA. Then there is a bunch of recent work, and some not yet published, showing there's more diversity than, between cortical areas than people thought. So there's this dogma that it's all the same. It's just a six-layer cortex, except I know, you know motor cortex is a little different. But that's how people usually report it. But it turns out that if you look in detail, for example, there are differences between frontal areas and sensory motor cortex areas. There's probably lots more differences. We just don't know how to identify yet. And as we um, dive deeper and deeper you know, below the voxel level and into the circuitry level, I think we're going to see more of that. Um, and we're starting to see at the voxel level and, and also the single cell um, some evidence about how binding and recursive structure and stuff like that that I was advocating for in the algebraic mind and in this 2014 paper um, in science, we're starting to see how some of that might be realized. There's very interesting work from Stan DeHaan and Josh Green's lab, um, Stephen Franklin, um, that's at least giving some possibilities about how we might actually represent these computations that are not hierarchical feature processing but that could work with hierarchical feature processing to do something more interesting. And machine learning itself, it's been very deep learning focused for the last several years, but even there, there's starting to be some people that are thinking about things that look more like neural computers, right? There's this other dogma that like brain's not a computer. Well, why not? Um, and in what respect is it not? And it's interesting, some of the people in machine learning are starting to do things that build in arithmetic and logic operations, variable binding, the stuff that I've been pushing for a long time. So to summarize, what should cognitive neuroscientists be doing next? I think the most important thing is we should be outlining a basic inventory of elements. We shouldn't be just doing PCA and saying this thing is associated with this word or something like that. We want to be finding what are the things that are like logic gates in microprocessors. Um, what are the information routing mechanisms? Not where does all the information go, but how do you actually route it from place to place? Um, which is crucial in microprocessors and got to be crucial in the brain. And the key lies, I think, in understanding how the machinery for hierarchical perception that we know is there works along with the machinery for symbol manipulation, variable binding, and so forth. 
Then we need to think about the intermediate level, which is like libraries in classical computer programming or, or subroutines. Like how do you put these basic things together to do more complex computation? I'm not saying the brain is literally a computer and certainly not a serial computer of the classical form, but our primary emphasis, I think, should be on primitives and how they might be usefully combined. And the last point is, or most directly directed to the question that David raised, is I don't think that bottom-up data dredging is ever going to get us there on their own. Um, bottom-up data dredging can't even tell us how a 6502 works. And there, you know, it's not that complicated what the logic gates are, how the arithmetic logic unit works. Any first-year computer scientist should be able to explain that. If, if PCA and, and lesion analysis is not getting us there, it's not going to get us um, to the brain either. The good news is that linguists, cognitive psychologists, developmental psychologists, we have a very noted one sitting just behind David, um, and so forth. Computer scientists have given us a lot of hints about what those primitives might be. Um, that uh, psychologist, Liz Belke, has given a whole other set that I could talk about in when we're up here that I think are also fabulous. Um, Bottom-up neuroscience is great, but we need computationally adept theorists who understand how the mind works if we're going to figure out what it is we're trying to decode. And thank you very much. <laughs>